Revelation chapter 22, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 5. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. And there shall be no night there. They need no lamp, nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And so what we have here as we begin chapter 22 is a continuation of what we've already been looking at in chapter 21. Chapter 21 verse 9 had mentioned an angel. And so the same angel that had been mentioned in chapter 21 verse 9 continues John's tour of New Jerusalem. And so what he now sees here is a pure river of water of life, and it's described as being clear as crystal. Now let me give you a couple of thoughts as we develop this, and then I'm going to give you some application. We need to remember that according to chapter 21, verse 1, there, are no longer, there is no longer any sea. Now if there is no longer any sea, that means that we no longer have what is called the hydrologic cycle. There's no sun, and we see that uh, in verse 23 of chapter 21. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it. There's no sun, which means that there's no water evaporating, which means that there's no rain. And so as we look at this, we need to understand that if there's no rain to fill any rivers, then when he speaks here in verse 22, verse 1, concerning a pure river of water of life, that tells us that we need to see this as a symbol, that this river of the water of life would be symbolic of the water of life that we have through Jesus Christ, or the eternal life that we have. This is a pure river that is proceeding from the throne and it's a symbol of the flow of eternal life from God's throne to heaven's inhabitants. And this is something that is pure, it's something that is alive, and something that flows from God. In the book of Isaiah, in chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, and let me develop this with you for a moment, it says there, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for Yah, or Jehovah, the Lord, is my strength and song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. God is the one who provides the water of life. And that's the point Isaiah was making. And so when you think of that, and then you start looking into the New Testament in John chapter 7, for example, and you look at verses 37 and 38 in John chapter 7. It says, On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. What you have here in John, and I'll be pointing this out as we conclude Revelation, is an invitation, an invitation to come and drink. God gives invitations from the book of Genesis all the way to the conclusion in the book of Revelation. And God gives invitations for us to have and to partake of this, this river of life, this water of life that flows freely from the Lord to us. Now, I believe, and, and I'm going to depart from my notes and just share what I believe the Holy Spirit has put in my heart for this particular passage for just a moment, just the application. I was speaking to somebody, and I'll, I'll, I'll preface it this way. I was speaking to somebody recently, 
And, uh, and there are those who think that the, the, the time that, that I come out of, which historically is now in church history, is referred to as the Jesus movement or the Jesus revolution. Well, there are many people who today think that that was a time that, that occurred maybe 40 years, 40 plus years ago. But um, the Jesus movement came and the Jesus movement went. And so what you have today is you have interesting, an interesting movement within the church that is, is a, a, a lot different than, than what I experienced as a 20-year-old who got saved. There are those today who, who think that, that people like me were just so out of touch with the average person that we can't connect with them anymore. And so what they do is they say, you need to have new ways to do that. You need to find new ways to communicate. You need to find new ways to grab hold of their attention and, and grab hold of their minds. And, and so if, if you were a student of what's happening in the church, and some of you may very well be, you would discover that there are a lot of experiments going on, and many of them are being printed in books and taught in seminars. If you want to grab somebody, make sure that you don't give a message more than 15 or 20 minutes. If you want to grab somebody's attention, especially the youth, you have to make sure that they're interactive, that there are things going on during the service that help them to be entertained as you're speaking to them. And, and uh, there's one thing after another. I get invitations. I've mentioned this before, but it's true. I get invitations monthly, sometimes more than once a month, to go to conferences. I get them on my emails. I get them in, in print a material that comes to me. You know, Pastor Dave, we'd like to teach you how to grow a church. And what you need to do is come to these seminars. And if you come to the seminar, we'll teach you how to communicate. We'll teach you how to use humor. We'll teach you how to use illustration. We'll teach you how to, to, to not cause people to be offended when you preach. And I wonder if John the Baptist would have gone to one of those seminars, but that's something different. I don't know. We don't need more seminars. We need more of the Spirit in our lives. We need more of the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I had a meeting. I, I meet with pastors on a monthly basis here at the church. We average 18 to 20 Calvary Chapel pastors who come, and I've been given responsibility as in, I'm on a certain council, particular council, to, uh, to minister to other pastors. And I, it's my passion, and I enjoy doing it. And so I've been doing it for years. I've, uh, on a monthly basis, I'll, I'll meet with pastors, 18, 20 pastors on average, sometimes more, sometimes less. And what we'll do is we'll sit down in the, in the cafe and they'll ask questions. Now, that may seem odd to you that pastors ask me as a pastor questions, but because I've been in the ministry for 40 plus years, there are certain things I've learned in ministry that I can help younger men with, especially the younger pastors who are just beginning. And so we talk quite often, and, and, I'll, and I'll have anecdotal stories that I'll share. I'll say, you know, these are things I learned from my pastor. You know, whenever we would go to plan out the pastor's conferences, because uh, Calvary Chapel under Pastor Chuck, Pastor Chuck would have um, yearly national, international pastor's conferences, and, and I was part of a board that gathered together to uh, plan out the conferences. That would be for all the 1,500-plus Calvary chapels in the world. And we'd gather, and... Pastor Chuck would, uh, would lead that meeting, and, and we would sit. There'd be 20, 25 of us who would be in a room, and we'd be seated there, and we'd be talking and whatever, and Chuck would come in, and the minute Pastor came in, um, everybody got quiet, always did, because when Chuck came in, he was like Dad, and, and quite seriously, he was like Dad, and we were his sons. And when he walked in, you know, when I was taught as a kid, when your father walks in the room, you show him respect. And that's what I did with, with my pastor, same thing. The minute Chuck walked in, I've got nothing to say. You've got everything to say. I want to hear what you have. And he would come, and Chuck was very humble. You know, he'd come, and he'd sit down, and he always sat in the same place. And as he sat down there, it would get quiet. And every time, someone would say the same thing to open the meeting. Pastor Chuck? I want to ask you, what is on your heart? What is the greatest concern that you have right now for Calvary Chapel Ministries? And Chuck, every time I ever heard him speak, an opening for such a meeting would say this, have we begun in the spirit only to be made perfect by the flesh? He'd say, he would say it every time 
we need to walk in the freshness and the power of the Holy Spirit. Because if we do not, this movement will die. It is a spirit-led, spirit-empowered movement. Because when you don't have the Holy Spirit in your midst, you're only religious, but you are not empowered. And God is giving to us this amazing promise. Jesus gave this promise. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And even as scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Here's something for you. Let's personalize it. Let's personalize it. Is the Holy Spirit flowing out of you right now? Is he splashing out of your life? You know, this water is intended to not only satisfy your thirst, but the water of life is for all who are thirsty. And so not only are you filled with the Holy Spirit, but you also have the influence that God gives to you to encourage others to have the same kind of thirst. And so when we look at this passage here, you can't help but think as it's speaking that there's this pure river of water of life. It's clear as crystal. It speaks of its purity. And so this water of life that's being spoken of here is, uh, is the symbol of the flow of the eternal life that comes from God's throne to all those who are inhabiting heaven. It, it is pure and, and it's alive and it's flowing. And, and even as it says it is clear as crystal, it proceeds from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Clear as crystal reveals that it is unpolluted and it also reflects the glory of God. Notice it proceeds from the throne of God and from the Lamb. Jesus is ruling in Hebrews 7, 26, it says, For such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. Jesus is ruling. I would encourage you, even as we begin, and we're going to end with the same encouragement here in chapter 22, I, I would encourage you to seek God for His Spirit's freedom in your life. Every day. Wake up in the morning every day. Every day. And say, God, fill me with your spirit. Work in me today. You see, the enemy doesn't sleep. And very often he's waiting at the foot of the bed for you to finally get your foot out and hit the ground so he can harass you. So he can trip you up. I'm not teaching you some spooky story. I'm not talking about El Cucuy. I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> it's the truth. The boogeyman. It is the truth, and you know it. You know it. He wants to destroy you. He wants to steal. He wants to kill, and he wants to destroy you. God has a wonderful plan for you, but he has one that will destroy you. You need to understand that. And you may be thinking, oh, I'm inconsequential. I have no power. I have no authority. I don't make a difference. I'm just a Christian. You are his enemy. He hates you. Understand that. He hates you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy your friends. He wants to destroy your neighborhood. He wants to destroy your city. He wants to destroy your state. He wants to destroy your nation. He wants to destroy the world. And you know what he is concerned with? One of the things I know for certain, he's concerned with the spirit-filled believers who do the works of God. He's concerned with them. Do you think he's concerned with backsliders and lukewarm? They're doing his work. They're doing his work. There's hardly anything as distasteful in the mouth of somebody as a hypocritical Christian. Oh, you want me to be like that guy I work with? Are you kidding me? I'm already miserable. Why do I want to be a miserable Christian like him? He's always telling me about God, but he didn't. I don't want to be that man that people point to and say, I don't want to be like that. I just don't want to be. I want to be the kind of person where they say, whatever he has, that's what I want. And how's that going to happen, guys? How's it going to happen? It happens when we stop making excuses for our sinfulness, and it happens when we die to ourselves. It happens when we say, God, fill me. God, I believe. I really do. There really is a heaven. There really is a hell. There really is a God. There really is a Savior named Jesus. There's really a powerful Holy Spirit. There really is all of this. This is true. When you understand that, your life changes. 
your life does change. And if you want to be impactful, I'm speaking to you as a pastor friend to you right now. Ask God to fill you with the Spirit. God, use me for your glory. God, use me for your glory. When you see some of the people God has used, there's one thing in common with these people, and that is they're just available and they're filled with the Spirit. Why can't you be? What would keep you from being? What is it? What is it in your life that is so important that you would rather have that than the power of the Spirit? What is it? A relationship? Money? A job? What is it? Fame? Personality? What, what is it? Because whatever it is, it isn't worth it. What is worth it is dying to self and living for Christ because Paul said, for me to die is gain. It's gain. You see, we're talking about the final chapter where it's all consummated. It's all ending. It all ends right here. And so there's this description. It's a tour of heaven. It's a tour of the capital city, New Jerusalem. This is waiting for you. I wonder if we believe that. This is waiting for you. This, this is your home. This is where you're going to, you can go home tonight and look at your house and you can say, man, I live in a dump compared to where I'm going to live someday. Compared to where I'm going to be someday. I've seen some amazing houses, so have you. I see them usually on TV. I don't have one. But I certainly have seen them, and I've had a chance to go to some very beautiful places over my, my years. I've toured many places over the years. God has been good to me. I've been in various castles, and I've been in various very, very large homes owned by very, very rich people. None of that. None of that's valuable. God says, you want to know something? Gold is so valueless, I use it as, as paving. I use it as paving. What you value so much, I use it as, as asphalt in heaven. We, we, that's so beyond me. It's so beyond us, isn't it? It really is. How are we going to have an understanding? God, fill us with your spirit. May your, Holy spirit. may your Holy Spirit drench us. May your Holy Spirit fill us. May your Holy Spirit pour out of us. May we live as if we believe what we tell other people we believe. May we do that. And so it's very powerful. It's very powerful what God is going to do. Now in verses 2 and 3, in the middle of its, of its street uh, and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. So the river flows down through the middle of the city. There's a tree there that is large enough to span the river. The river's in the midst of the street, and the tree is on both sides of the river. It's filling that. The river is not necessarily wide, but it is narrow, and that allows for this, allows for this arrangement. And what you see here is called the tree of life. Now, this tree of life that we're looking at here in verse 2 the tree of life is it's the, what is called the counterpart of the tree of life found in the Garden of Eden. Remember all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, it is revealed that to eat of the tree of life would make physical death impossible. And so what you have here is, is, is something that makes us aware of the fact that we're intended to inhabit New Jerusalem forever. And in New Jerusalem, this tree bears fruit that is edible continually. Now, I should touch on this. Um, a fruit-bearing tree is, is a concept that you find in, in the Bible that is often used as a picture of the blessing of God, a fruit-bearing tree. Um, fruit on a tree provides food, and therefore it would be regarded as, as a blessing. You know, the fruit that, there is, is, that is there on the tree, if you can take of it, you can, you can eat of it. And here on earth, obviously, it provides nutrients in all of us uh, for, and all of that for us. And, and so it's something that, that the Jew, during the time of the writing of the Bible, and to this day, really, they recognize that to have a, a fruit tree 
was to symbolize that God was providing for us. And so what you have here is you have a, a, a tree that is symbolizing the blessings of God. You see, it's not that you need to eat the, the fruit to, be, to, be, uh, to, to remain alive. Yeah, I have a friend of mine who asked me that a while back. He said, David, he said, listen, if we're in, when we're with the Lord and everything is, is completed, why do you have a tree that you eat of? I mean, the Bible speaks concerning this, this fruit of this tree. Uh, why do you need to eat it? He said, is it, is it going to be necessary for us to eat it to remain alive? And I said, I said no. The reason that, that, that there's a tree that is there is to symbolize the fact that God is providing for you continually. Will we eat in heaven? Yeah. Yeah, we will. But will we eat to live? No. We will eat for the sheer, the pleasure of the amazing taste that you will experience. Um, think of for just a moment, and there's no unpleasant taste there, so you could just remove that from your mind. Like, ooh, I, you know, no, there's no unpleasant taste at all. I don't want to go on this too long. I just thought of it. But um, I'll say it very quickly. Um, there have been times when you, you, you see some grapes or you see some strawberries or, or fruit. You know, if you like fruit. I happen to like certain kinds of fruit, mango or something like that, pineapple. And you look at it and you say, oh, man, that looks good. And then you take some, oh, man, it's bitter. Oh, it's no good. It's no good. So you give it to somebody else. <laughs> you won't have that experience. I can't imagine the perfection of taste. But whatever it tastes like will be unimaginably delicious. There will be great pleasure in eating whatever fruit there may be that the Lord provides. Absolutely. So I actually think it's going, to be, it's going to be cool. I do. I think it's going to be cool. Sit down. Oh, look at this. Oh, ooh, it's too much. You know, it's, it's good. I don't think there's menudo in heaven. <laughs> Some of you will say, well, praise God. You know, for me, that's, that's going to be a loss. But, but fruit represents the provision of God and the pleasure. That's what it represents. Now, when it says in verse 2 that it, it bore 12 fruits each year, yielding its fruit every month, you need to remember that there really isn't time the way we understand time today because they're not going to have seasons, 12-month year, you know, 12 month years and things like that. There's no longer any time. So this is a picture of a continuous provision. That's the point he's making. Now, it speaks of the leaves of the tree being for the healing of the nations. Uh, that can be literally health-giving leaves. And so the leaves of these trees promote the enjoyment of life in New Jerusalem. It's not for healing sickness because there is no sickness. You see, life in heaven is going to be filled with energy. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be joyful. As I mentioned, food is eaten not to sustain life, but simply to make life more pleasant. And that's how it's going to be when we're there, and it's going to be beautiful. He says in verse 3, there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. The curse of the earth has been removed. And as already mentioned and already seen, there is no longer sorrow, there is no longer sickness, there is no longer death, there is no longer pain. None of that. None of that. Ever again. No more mourning. No more hurting. Just joy forevermore. In, in the book of Genesis, in chapter 3, in verses 17 through 19, uh, we read, To Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. You shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. That's the curse. 
I, I grow weeds very well. Plants, that's another question. But I can grow weeds and uh, I do a good job of that. Well, there won't be any of that anymore. You see, creation, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 19, creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed, for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. So creation itself is still in bondage because of the curse, but because there's a new heaven and new earth, there's no more curse. And all of this is no longer in existence. No more pain or sorrow or anything like that. Verse 4, they shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun for the Lord God gives them light. And they shall reign forever. We're going to be able, and this is so powerful, just the thought. They shall see his face, verse 4. They shall see his face. We shall see him we will be able to endure the glory of God without being consumed by it. Um, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16, Paul said, God dwells in unapproachable light whom no man has seen or can see. God in his glory, and here's something for you, I'll take a moment to develop this. No man, no human sinful person None of us in this room, even though we're redeemed, none of us has the capacity to look at the full glory of God unveiled. Jesus Christ is the glory of God in human flesh. That's how men could see him. But one, on one occasion, Moses, who was very, well, he had fellowship with God as a, a friend would speak to one face to face. On one occasion, Moses was speaking to God. It's recorded in the book of Exodus in chapter uh, 33 in verses 18 through 20. And, and, and there it says, he, Moses said, please show me your glory. Then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no man shall see me and live. You know, sometimes, even a moment ago, we were singing, show us, show us your glory. Moses asked that. And one day we shall see his glory. And one day we shall. But God said, no man can look upon me with unveiled glory and live. To look upon God, it's, 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 it's impossible to do that without having repercussions. But one of these days... And this is what's being spoken of. One of these days, we will have glorified bodies and this full fellowship with him. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, it says it like this. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And if you have this hope in you, you purify yourself, John went on to say, even as he is pure. What is one of the motivations for holy living, for a living separated life? Because one of these days I'll be seeing him face to face. One of these days. And so you prepare yourself. You live a life separated to the Lord and separate from sin. You move away from the things that keep you in bondage. And you move to the things that are part of the freedoms that Christ has given to you. So instead of being like a dog that returns to its vomit or a pig that goes back to the mud that it's been cleansed from, we follow the Lord with obedience and joy, being blessed by God, and in preparation for the day that we will finally see him as he is. Because if we really believe, and here's something else for you. You know, when I first got saved, I was taught, I was taught this from the beginning, that Jesus Christ is even at the door. Behold, I come quickly is something I heard when I was first saved. And so we were taught back when I got saved, and obviously this has been taught in the church for long, for many centuries, be ready. Be ready. Be prepared. Be waiting to see him. Live in such a way that should he show up at this moment, you'll be ready. 
You don't want him to come suddenly and unexpectedly. You want to be as the picture of a bride is prepared for her groom. You want to be ready for when he comes. And so I was taught that. I was taught that from the beginning. Now, was I living a real mature and very spiritually deep life? And was I like just like, you know, a miniature Billy Graham or Chuck Smith? No. And I was a 20-year-old snotty-nosed kid who was still rebellious. I was a hippie. I was a monster. You know, I was from the drugs and the alcohol and everything that went along with it. And, and, and it, takes, it takes time. It takes time for God to cleanse. It does. Don't get frustrated and, 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 don't, and don't get to the point where, you're, where you want to give up. You know, I'll, I'll, never, I'll never be. No, that's not my message. I don't, I don't preach sinless perfectionism. I need God's grace like we sang tonight every day. I need the grace of God every day, every day. I want to breathe it in and pour it out. I, I need that. We do. What I am saying is this. Once again, I, I believe that there are many people who can speak very well on issues related to the rapture, the last days, and things of that nature, who perhaps haven't allowed that to change their behavior. I, I've encountered more than one who's able to sit down and give a good rap about the last days. There are quite a number of people who like to go to prophecy seminars and get the CDs or DVDs and listen to memorize, and they're able to communicate, but they're not being affected. They're not, they're not, their lives aren't changing. You know, for me, well, I'll, I'll say it quickly. Um, just remember, because I've shared this with you before, Jesus taught us something, and, and you need to know that there's a difference between, and this will take a moment, um, there's a difference between thinking like a Greek and thinking like a Hebrew. And what do I mean by that? Well, during the time of Christ, Greek thinking was infiltrating the nation of Israel. There are those who are being influenced by what is called Hellenism, the Greek ways, Greek culture, Greek language, and Greek philosophy. And it was infiltrating the Jewish culture. Americans are very Greek. We think Greek. I mean, you have people who learn the Socratic method for teaching and stuff. A lot of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Americans are, are very Greek in the way we think. And here's what I mean by that. The Greeks had one thing in common, and that was this, that they believed that knowledge was the accumulation of information. That the more information I have, the more knowledge I have. That's a Greek way of thinking. The Hebrews are different. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Because in the Hebrew mind, the accumulation of information was to produce transformation. And the way that somebody was demonstrating that they knew something is when their lives changed. So in the Hebrew way of thinking, and you'll see this when we get into Matthew chapter 7 as we're studying Matthew now on Sunday mornings. You'll see it very clearly where Jesus speaks concerning a man building on sand and another man building on a solid rock. They both endure the same kinds of things, but one man's house falls and the other one stands. And he says, why? He says, well, because one person heard and did and the other person heard and did not do. That's Hebrew. So Jesus, as a rabbi, would be teaching his students, don't just hear me, hear and do. Hear and obey. You'll see this in just a moment. I'm actually getting ahead of my notes right now. And so all I'm saying is, listen, we've gone through Revelation. It's taken a while. You've gotten information. May it change the way that we live so that we really do think, you know what, Lord, and believe, you're even at the door. My life should be different. I'm a believer in Christ. People ought to know that. And so that's what we're looking at right now. Now he says his name shall be on their foreheads. That's another way of saying that they belong exclusively to him. And they're going to have joy forever. They shall reign, according to verse 5, forever and ever. Verse 6, then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophet sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And see, that's the point I was just making. 
These words, he said, are faithful and true. In other words, the things that we're looking at right now, if we had even an inkling of what he's trying to communicate, would make us wonder, and we'd say, this is too good to be true. So we say, no, these words are faithful and true. God's word is trustworthy. It's like what it says in 2 Samuel 7, 28, where we read, O Lord God, you are God. Your words are true. And then Jesus in verse 7 says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. His coming is even at the door. Belief translates into action. Let's see. I remember it was February 9th, 1971, long before many of you were born. And some of you were already very old at that time. <laughs> I had gone to a Bible study at Calvary Chapel. We had heard that Jesus was coming. And we were to be prepared. And I was in bed, when the, and, and they had said there were going to be earthquakes and this and that. I was in bed when my parents' house began to shake. It began to move. There was a huge earthquake they hit. And I have to tell you, you know, I'm, I'm a veteran of thousands of earthquakes. That was a pretty strong one. And I lived in Norwalk at the time. And that was a strong earthquake. And the house began to tilt and move. And when it did, I got scared, naturally. And then I remembered what the pastor had said the night before. He said, this is a sign of Christ's coming. And I remember pushing the blankets off. This is true, you won't believe it. It's kind of stupid now. But I pushed the blankets off, and I lifted my hands up. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. He didn't. It was just an earthquake. <laughs> but from the beginning, from the beginning, we were taught Jesus' word is true, right? And he says he's coming soon. I come quickly. And so what is he saying here? Same thing. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I am coming quickly. I'm even at the door. Therefore, live as if you expect that. And Isaiah says it like this, Isaiah 56, 1, Thus says the Lord, keep justice, do righteousness, for my salvation is about to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Romans 13, 11, Do this, understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Titus 2, 11 through 14, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us, to say no to ungodliness and worldly passion, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. And so that's what Jesus is saying. He said, keep the words of the prophecy of this book. Now in verse 8, I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down and down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. He said to me, see that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Worship belongs exclusively to God not to angels, and, and I'll say this quickly, and not to other believers. Be very careful. I don't think I have to say that here in this fellowship, but I'll say it. Be very careful that you keep your eyes on Jesus. Men will let you down. I do. Do I want to let you down? No. Do I want to be a good man? Yes. Can I and will I let you down? Yes, I can. Will I? I hope I don't. But can I? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do I plan on letting you down? No. Do I want to ever let you down? No. But can I? Yeah. Who can't let you down? 
Jesus. Where should your eyes be? On Jesus. On Jesus. In a world that is longing for heroes, and in a world filled with those who want to be somebody's hero, it's a dangerous combination. The key to godly living is fear of God and remembering who you are and what you need, the grace of God. And remembering, like Paul said, who is Paul and who is Apollos? We are just servants. If we can understand that. Now, by the way, that's something I say to myself as a pastor, but that's what I say to other pastors when I minister to them. We're not celebrities. We're not that important. We're simply servants of the king. Make sure that people see the king and not you. Keep your eyes on the Lord. John is so taken that he actually falls down before an angel and he says, worship God. Something he has to be reminded of. He'd done this before in chapter 19. It's the second time he does it in Revelation. In verse 10, he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book. For the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And so, the time is short. You need to proclaim these prophecies. You need to share what I've revealed here in the Revelation. There is no more Revelation coming. This is it. If you reject this, there's no new message that is coming. It's like what it says in Jude, verse 3. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. Is there a need for a new revelation? No. Was there a need for a new book, a new holy book? No. Does that mean that, 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 that I don't, as a person, that I don't accept the Quran as the word of God? That's exactly what it means. I do not accept the Quran as the word of God. It's not. Do I accept the, uh, the Pearl of Great Price or the Book of Mormon as words from God? No, I do not. Why? There is no new revelation coming. This is it. And God gave it to us, and he said, Contend earnestly for the faith that one time for all time has been delivered to the saints. This is the truth, and this is what we proclaim. So when somebody says, oh, I have a new revelation, if it doesn't fit within what Scripture has taught, then I reject it. So if they want to say that Jesus came to Palmyra, New York, and there were golden tablets and special spectacles and things of that nature, I, I reject that. I, I, I care for the people who are trying to share that with me because I care about them as people. I want them to know the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't mock them, and I certainly don't think they're ridiculous people. They're sincere, but they're wrong. But they're wrong. The word of God was given to us one time for all time. And as believers, we contend for the faith that has been delivered to us and trusted to us. Now, when he says in verse 11, he who was unjust, let him be unjust still, etc., that would speak of people's response to the truth. Those who hear but reject the truth and remain in sin are sealing their own futures. If you hear the truth and harden yourself, you're sealing your own eternity. In verse 12, behold, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I'm coming quickly and I'm bringing a reward. That's a reward that believers receive when he returns. He rewards their faithfulness as they have lived and served him. It's like what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.10 when he said, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. So he's speaking of the reward that comes. Blessed, verse 4, 14, are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers 
sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. So notice, you heard me mention a moment ago about hearing and doing. That's what he's saying. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life. So those who are qualifying for entrance are those who have been obedient to his word. One of my favorite scriptures um, is, is Luke 6.46. Jesus says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? If you love me, he said in John 14, 15, keep my commandments. You know, my wife, my wife, Marie, could tell me all day long she loves me. But if, she, if her activities and actions do not line up with her words, I'll have every reason to wonder whether or not she knows what the word love means. If she says, I love you exclusively, but that's only on Friday and Saturday, and the rest of the week I go out with other guys, I'd have a bit of a problem with that. She has to make a choice to love me. And I, and I wasn't willing to take a relationship that was only good two out of seven days. I've shared this with you before. I was teasing her about it just the other day, so I'll say it to you out loud. Some of you have heard me say this. Marie and I were dating. We'd been going around for a while going out. We, I was taking her out on a date. It was a Saturday night. I was on the 5 freeway. I was going in Anaheim. I still remember the general location. If any of you guys know where Disneyland is, uh, we all do. <laughs> Off the 5, going south. And as we were driving, now you got to understand, Marie was 22. And she was a new Christian, probably two or three months old in the Lord. And you may find this interesting, but I've never been one who dominates somebody and tells them, you need to do this and you can't do that. It appears that way sometimes when I'm teaching. What I'm doing is opening my heart to you. But on one-on-one -on -one relationship, I believe that God directs the footsteps of those whom he's called. And so I'll encourage you, but I don't condemn you. So Marie and I are dating. And as we're driving, she points out this, this place off to the right. She says, you see that right there? And I said, yeah. She says, I was there last night. It was a, a dance club. I said, really? She goes, yeah. I said, what were you doing? She goes, oh, I went dancing. We really loved to dance. She used to love to dance. I said, oh. So we're driving. She said, some guy was dancing with me. I said, well, yeah, you go to dance. She goes, he asked for my, for my phone number. I said, oh, did you give it to him? She said, no. Why not? Well, I told him I have a boyfriend. This is the truth before the Lord. I turned like that and I looked at her. You got a boyfriend? <laughs> I'm not kidding. I was shocked. I didn't know it. I didn't know it. You got a boyfriend? She goes, yeah. And it got quiet. I got go. Why am I wasting my money on this girl? <laughs> Who? Who's your boyfriend? You. And this is as God is my witness. I looked at her. I said, I'm not your boyfriend. She goes, what? I said, I'm not your boyfriend. What do you mean by that? I said, listen, if I were your boyfriend, you wouldn't have been there last night dancing. She never went again. <laughs> it's the truth. I didn't tell her not to go. Go, dance. Dance your feet off. <laughs> but if you're going to be mine, it ain't going to happen. Do you think the Lord may speak that to your heart sometime? He's spoken it to mine. I've got a Savior. you got a Savior? Who? You, if I was your savior, you wouldn't be doing that. 
Is that hard? It's not hard. It's not hard. It's just real. It's just real. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Isn't that a beautiful question? Isn't that powerful? It's very touching. It's a very touching question. So, am I teaching you legalism? No, I'm teaching you love. I'm teaching you to love him. Because when you love him, you have liberty in him. And when you have liberty in him, you're free to serve him. And you do it with joy. Because you know the reward that is awaiting us is so amazing. It's so amazing. And so that's the way it works. Outside are the habitual sinners. He gives a list of them. Dogs. That's interesting. And I'm not going to go through everyone. They're self-explanatory. But when he speaks concerning outside are dogs, you think, well, yeah, you mean there's no doggies in heaven? You know? Dogs are, are, is a word. It's not like the, the, young, young people say, it was happening, dog. It's not that. <laughs> Though sometimes it is. Uh, uh, dogs are men of low character. Men of low character. In Scripture are called dogs. Uh, Isaiah 56.10, I'll give you an example. Israel's watchmen are blind. They all lack knowledge. They are all mute dogs. They cannot bark. They lie around and dream. They love to sleep. So dogs are, is, a, is a word that refers to people with no character. And so that's what he's referring to. And then he speaks of the others. And I want you to remember, sorcerers. Yes, that's magic. And yes, that can be casting spells. But it's also the word that has a root where you get, it's called, it, the Greek word is pharmakeia. Pharmakeia is where we get the word pharmaceutical. Pharmaceutical is translated drugs. And so he's speaking about those who are addicted to drugs, drug users is what's being referred to, people who habitually are using drugs. And yes, they were used for casting spells and a variety of other things, but that's what it's referring to. Sexually immoral, murderers, idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. This is just a general list of those who don't enter in. Then he says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who hears say, come. Let him who thirsts come. And whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. We close with a couple of thoughts. When he says in verse 16, I, Jesus, sent my angel to testify. He is the line of David. He brings the, this brings the day of his rule. He is called the bright and the morning star. So as the morning star ushers in the sun, he said, so shall I usher in the eternal glories of the kingdom. But when it says in verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come, this is an invitation. There are those that on occasion will say, why do you guys, well, you Calvary guys, I usually say you Calvary guys, why do you Calvary guys give invitations? I get letters sometimes where people ask that question. Why do you give invitations? Because from Genesis to Revelation, you see invitations. From Genesis to Revelation. Are you going you're gonna to go all the way back when, when the scripture says that Adam and Eve had partaken of the forbidden fruit and the voice of the Lord cried out and said, Adam, where are you? Now, you need to understand, you need to understand this, that that, that was not God saying, gosh, I can't see you. There's nothing hidden from the sight of God. It's not like suddenly they disappeared. So what would that be? Why would God say to Adam, where are you? Well, because, because Satan asked Eve, has God said? 
Eve misrepresented God, took of the forbidden fruit, gave to her husband. He did eat. And so in the taking of the forbidden fruit, their eyes were opened. They entered into a sinful state. And God is simply saying, now that you have rejected my word, which was a command to you not to do something, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? And that's the whole point. Where are you? He wasn't saying, I don't know where you are. He was saying, tell me where you are. Do you know what that's called? Confession. It's not like I don't know. It's that you need to know. Because there are too many people who will not admit where they're at. But the best thing you can ever do is say, I have sinned and I'm sorry. That's called confession. You have invitation from the beginning to the end. The spirit and the bride say, come. Jesus said, if any man comes to me, if any man's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. It's an invitation. If any man desires to follow me, let him pick up his cross daily and follow me. That's an invitation. You see invitations all from Genesis to, to Revelation. There are those who are arguing right now, saying, oh, no, you don't give invitation. No, I see Jesus. I see God himself. I see the spirit and the bride doing the same. And by the way, that's what we're supposed to be doing. Every one of us are deputized by the spirit of God to take this word out. Everyone. And here's something for you. Pray about whom you might know who doesn't know Jesus and start sharing with them. Share with them. Does anybody here know anybody who doesn't know Jesus? We all, we all do. We all do. Pray for them. Share with them. Invite them. Tell them what you know. And say, come and see. Come and see. Invite them. You know what? Christmas is a good time to do that. Christmas is a good time to do that. Invite them to church. Watch what God does. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. And then finally... Don't add to this book and don't take from it. This is the entire revelation from God. It, when it's, it says in Deuteronomy 12.32, see that you do all I command you, do not add to it or take away from it. That is something that is really not simply the revelation, though it is applying to that, but in reality it can speak of the whole word of God. And then finally, he who testifies to these things says, I am coming quickly. And all we need to do tonight is simply say, Amen. Come quickly, Lord Jesus.